Good afternoon, members of the Stevens family, members of the court, members of the bar, and friends. This meeting of the bar of the Supreme Court of the United States has been called to honor the memory of John Paul Stevens, who served as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court from 1975 until 2010. In addition to his time on the court, Justice Stevens served his country as a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, as counsel to the House Judiciary Committee, and as a code breaker in the U.S. Navy during World War II. Over decades on the bench, he dedicated his life to the rule of law and to the judicial craft. He was a jurist who fearlessly exercised independent judgment, guided by experience and the essential values underlying the Constitution and the American project. He was a person of integrity, blessed with a singular intellect, pragmatic temperament, humble nature, and generous soul. He was a devoted husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, a beloved colleague, an inspiring mentor, and an extraordinary figure in American law. The court and this nation are forever better for his service and we all miss him greatly. I want today to express my appreciation to Chief Judge David Barron and Teresa Roseboro, who co-chaired the Arrangements Committee for this meeting, and to the members of that committee, Stuart Baker, Preta Bonsall, David De Bruin, Sarah Eisenberg, Jeff Fisher, Ian Heath Gershengorn, Judge Pamela Harris, Justice Leandra Kruger, Judge Lewis Lyman, Nancy Martyr, Judge Randolph Moss, Judge Allison Nathan, Skip Paul, Teresa Reed Dippo, Cliff Sloan, and Douglas Winthrop. I also want to express my gratitude to Jamal Green and Carol Lee, who co-chaired the Resolutions Committee, and to the members of that committee, Diane Amen, Christopher Eisgruber, Daniel Farber, Jean Galbraith, Abner Green, Alatunde Johnson, Troy McKenzie, Eduardo Peñalver, Deborah Pearlstein, George Rutherglen, Adam Samaha, Robert Shapiro, Kate Shaw, and Sonia West. The meeting today will be chaired by Chief Judge Barron, and Scott Harris will be the secretary. I'll now turn the podium and the meeting over to Chief Judge Barron. Madam Solicitor General, Mr. Chief Justice, Associate Justices, members of the Stevens family, Mr. Attorney General, members of the Supreme Court Bar. It's a great honor to be with you all to remember a great man. But in saying that, I cannot help but think it seems a misleading way to describe Justice Stevens. Not because it's inaccurate, but because it does not capture what made him great. That description inevitably calls to mind an overpowering person, a larger-than-life person. But Justice Stevens' greatness, his gift, his example, his superpower, was to show that gentleness has a power all its own, and so too does humility. The word that most comes to my mind when I think of him, and it has since I first met with him for my interview for a clerkship, is timelessness. Time seems slower in his presence as if he had access to a longer time scale than most people do. A sense of the depth of time, how long it runs back, and how far it will run into the future. And how important it is when making decisions of consequence, as Justice Stevens did for all of his professional life, to be aware of that time scale. He was a war hero, a pilot, a superstar law student, an accomplished tennis player, and I can attest from personal observation, an average golfer. But he was, in all respects, a great person, with his twinkle, his decency, his embodiment of the very best of our country just by being who he was. He had his own kind of overpowering presence in the way that gentleness and decency uniquely can. 
Justice Stevens was an absurdly competent and productive person. He wrote more separate opinions than any justice in the history of the court, and he did it with fewer clerks than he could have had and while writing the first draft of every opinion. He served on this court for more than three decades, and then as that, if this, that were not enough, he, upon his retirement, wrote three books and became a regular contributor for the New York Review of Books with an appearance on the Colbert Report to boot. The appearance came complete with the perfect quip. When asked by Colbert himself if there were any decisions that Justice Stevens regretted, other than this interview, the justice asked. <laughs> yeah, Colbert replied. I don't think so, Justice Stevens said. <laughs> he gave new meaning to lifelong learning and to second acts. His last reunion with us was held at his second home in Florida. His daughter, Sue, was there to accompany him as were members of his chamber staff and almost all his law clerks, numbering more than 100 strong, including those who served with him while he was on the Seventh Circuit, a court he loved and that he made sure we knew to respect. At the event, we held a Q&A with the justice. He was by then somewhat faint of hearing, and his voice, still with his beloved Chicago in it, and always soft, was even softer then. But his mind was, as always, sharp, and his wit, too. He had just written his third book, he was, to be clear, 99 years old at the time. The book ran more than 500 pages. But there was one passage in that book that warranted special inquiry. It was the portion in which he had lavished praise on a particular group of people, his law clerks. This passage, we all thought, was of surpassing interest. <laughs> and it was in need of intensive interrogation. Just how great were we? What exactly were our greatest features? These were, of course, very un-Stevens-like questions. But in the moment, we could be forgiven for having lost sight of his example, and so we asked him, just did, how did you go about choosing such a tremendously gifted group? And here, 99, with a cane to assist him in walking, the hearing a bit hard, the voice soft but no less Chicagoan, there was that twinkle and the perfectly Stevens-esque answer. Case by case, he said. <laughs> he knew what he was saying, that he wanted us to know that he was not a rules person. He was a case by case person, a context person, a facts person, a functionalist person, a no chivalrous person, a realist person, a Leon Green, Wiley Rutledge person. One sentence, a few words, and a whole philosophy of law and of life. Well, actually, half of a philosophy because he was saying in those few words that he was also an every person has a unique worth person, and every person deserves a fair shot person, an independent minded person, a fair competition person, a no one is above the law person, a respect everyone person, and without saying it, he was also reminding us why he was a person to treasure person. In the remarks you will now hear from four of his former clerks and one young accomplished lawyer who just also happens to be his granddaughter, we hope you will get a sense of what made him the great justice, the great judge, and the great person that he was and that he remains to all of us. Our first speaker will be the Honorable Damian Williams, who is the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York and who clerked for Justice Stevens in the 2008 term. It's, uh, it's an honor to stand here in this great hall and to eulogize a great man, Justice John Paul Stevens. I have two tasks today. First, I've been asked to speak as a representative of the law clerks from the justices' final years on the bench. And second, I've been asked to reflect on the principle, a principle that is stitched into the justices' life and in his career in the law, that in this nation, the law is supreme and no one is above it. Let's start with the light stuff. I clerked for the justice in his second to last year on the court, 
and that by that time he had seen the law from every conceivable angle. As a kid in Chicago, he felt the jagged edge of the law when his father was wrongfully convicted of embezzlement, an experience that nearly ruined his family through and through. He witnessed the law's power to redeem when that same conviction was overturned on appeal. He fought for our laws in the Pacific Theater in World War II. He hung a shingle and he practiced the law for years. He helped enforce the law when he investigated corruption in the Illinois Supreme Court. And of course, he helped shape the law as a judge and a justice on this court for decades. So by the time we started our clerkship, Justice Stevens had seen it all, or so it seemed. Now, this was 2008, the days of hope and change. A young lawyer from Chicago had just been elected president, and a future president had been elected vice president. Now, one day, the justice walked into the clerk's office and he stood in the doorway. And it became clear that he wasn't there to discuss a case or some legal issue that was on his mind. Instead, he started telling us about something in the law that he had never done. He explained that, by tradition, the Chief Justice swears in the new president, but neither law nor custom dictates who should swear in the new vice president. And he explained that in all his years on the bench, no one had asked him to swear in the new vice president. And then he turned and he went back into his office. <laughs> we didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> Was it an offhand remark? Was it a clue or a breadcrumb that we were supposed to pick up and do something with? We didn't know. But we, the law clerks, decided all on our own that it was time for a little off-the-books activity, a scheme to get Joe Biden to ask Justice Stevens to swear him in. Now, if you think I'm about to describe how our little conspiracy worked and who joined it, you would be wrong. <laughs> or quite wrong, as Justice Stevens would have put it. Um, let's just say that a few weeks later, the phone rang in chambers. Janice Hawley answered it. We were in the other room and, and could hear. Oh, it's Joe Biden on the phone. Oh, he wants to speak with Justice Stevens. We waited. A few minutes later, Justice Stevens walked back into the clerk's office, stood in the doorway, and with a smile on his face said, wouldn't you know, Joe Biden just called me and asked to swear him in as the next vice president. And then he turned and went back into his office. He never asked us if we had a hand in that coming together. But if he had, we obviously, obviously would have pled the fifth. Okay, one more story. Later in our clerkship, the justice gathered the law clerks in the office to talk about hiring a new batch of law clerks. And the justice began to talk about the term and how it was going and how he felt he was doing. And he told us that unlike prior years, he wasn't planning on hiring his full complement of four law clerks and that instead he was gonna hire just one. It was time. And even though we knew we were witnessing a significant moment in history, everything about it was classic Justice Stevens. Low key, plain spoken, humble. Even when closing the final chapter in his service to this nation, a body of service that consistently sought to preserve and protect the rule of law. Now, the rule of law and the supremacy of the law were uncontested for much of the justice's life. They were just assumed to be true. It animated so much of his personal story, his rise to this court, and his work on the court. 
And even though the justice passed away less than three years ago, you cannot possibly measure the distance between then and now in years. So much has happened. So much is now up for debate. And so much of that debate is coarse and cheap. For Justice Stevens, January 6th was just a date. George Floyd was just a name. And another land war in Europe was just inconceivable. And on and on and on. I think we can all agree that Justice John Paul Stevens was a man for all seasons. But I often find myself wondering what he would make of this season. Our nation stands on troubled soil today. That is a fact. And Justice Stevens did not believe in airbrushing facts, so let's not do that. I think we all know that before the justice passed, there was an urgency in his writings, both in his dissents in his final years on the bench and also in some of the works that he authored in retirement. It was not an abandonment of hope, but instead a questioning of the durability of certain principles that he thought were fundamental and true. And I'm sure these past few years would have upset him, but still, I do not think he would have given up hope. Nor should we. Because his life is all the testimony we need to know that great things can grow from troubled soil. This was a man from Chicago, a city that's best known for its Cubs and its corruption. This is a man whose family endured injustice and the Great Depression. This is a man who went to war to defend democracy. And out of all of that emerged the man who was chosen for the federal bench because of his fierce independence and integrity. A man who was chosen for this court because of his unimpeachable character. Corruption, injustice, depression, war, Watergate. These are not small things. These are not easy things. These are not happy things. But they are the soil from which he grew. They explain him and how we as a nation got him. His personal story also explains his belief, a belief that ran bone deep, that in this country, the law is supreme and applies to all, the powerful and the powerless, rich and poor, friend and foe. Because of him, a president, despite his high office, is not immune from suit. And it is that same belief, unshakable belief, in the supremacy of the law and that no one is above it that led him to dislike official immunity of all sorts, especially the most notorious of them all, state sovereign immunity, a doctrine that he described as, and I quote, the vainest of all legal fictions. He was firm in his view that some English common law principles didn't make the trip across the Atlantic. Now that's how he viewed this world as a justice, but it's also how he lived his life. Gentle and kind to all, humble and unassuming with all. To borrow from Kipling, he walked with kings and queens but never lost his common touch. This was a great man who was also a good man. And talking about him makes me miss him even more and miss the days when we had him. And even though we cannot ask him what he would make of these days and these times, I'm sure if he were here, he would do what he did when we clerked for him, and that is to first ask us what we think. And then he would listen patiently because he believed in us and was proud of us. The justice is gone. And the times, yes, have changed. But the sturdy, stately, beautiful legacy that he built 
is still here. It's in this room. It's in his, daughter, his granddaughter, Hannah. It's in us. It's in the light that he breathed into the law for a nation that he loved. And I believe that Justice Stevens would expect us, the keepers of his legacy, to forge ahead, to not lose faith, and to summon our better angels. John Paul Stevens is and will always be one of those angels. Thank you, Damien. Our next speaker is Professor Eduardo Pelnavir, who is the president of Seattle University and who clerked for Justice Stevens in the 2000 term. Good law clerks pay close attention to their justice's passions. As a Stevens clerk in the 2000 term, I quickly learned about several things that the justice held dear. One was golf. He loved all sports to be sure, especially his cubbies, but golf held a special place in Justice Stevens' heart. He was a devoted, some might say even a little obsessive follower of professional golf. During our term at the court, computer terminals were not connected to the internet. Uh, security reasons, I guess. Each of us had a single internet-enabled computer in Chambers. If you wanted to use the internet, you had to go to that machine. If my kids are watching online, I'm talking about the dark ages before smartphones and streaming video. One of my regular duties as a law clerk was to log on to that internet computer every few days to check on Justice Stevens' fantasy golf standings. Justice Stevens also loved playing golf. Monday mornings in chambers often began with the justice offering us self-deprecating accounts of his weekend golf exploits. But the justice didn't confine his golfing to weekends or even to the golf course. Once my co-clerk Andy Siegel walked in on Justice Stevens and Justice O'Connor testing their putting skills on the practice green that the justice kept conveniently inside his office. In a more serious vein, Another passion of Justice Stevens was fairness. As an antitrust lawyer, he had a deep respect for the power of competition to drive innovation, and despite being a fierce, although always good-natured competitor, or perhaps precisely because of that, he richly appreciated the importance of level playing fields that provide everyone with the opportunity to compete. There's one final thing I'll mention that Justice Stevens loved. It quickly became apparent to me and to my co-clerks that Justice Stevens plainly, or as the justice might have said, pellucidly, relished jousting with Justice Scalia. Although both men possessed singularly brilliant legal minds, their personal and intellectual styles could not have been more divergent. Their footnote battles were the stuff of legend. One of, one of the many issues about which they found themselves in profound disagreement was the very meaning of fairness itself. For Justice Scalia, the central attribute of fairness was always formal equal treatment. For Justice Stevens, in contrast, fairness was a complex and contextual concept, resistant to rigid characterization on questions ranging from affirmative action to criminal justice to antitrust law. Justice Stevens favored accounts of fairness that afforded decision makers the discretion to depart from strictly equal treatment in the service of a more substantive kind of fairness. Flexibility and above all judgment were essential for fairness in his sense. Tellingly, one of Justice Stevens' trademark, trademark adjectives for a decision making he found to fall short in this regard was to call it wooden. So if a case combined questions about fairness and equal treatment, compelling subject matter, and Justice Scalia on the other side, Justice Stevens was sure to be fully engaged. 
And so I'd like to spend the rest of my brief remarks this afternoon talking about a blockbuster case from the 2000 term that scored that particular hat trick. No, not that case. We're not supposed to cite that one. <laughs> the case I have in mind is PGA Tour versus Martin. Casey Martin was a professional golfer who suffers from a rare circulatory disorder that obstructs the flow of blood in his right leg. And for Martin, walking creates the risk of hemorrhaging, blood clots, or worse. In college and in competition to qualify for the PGA Tour, he was allowed to use a golf cart. When he earned his spot on the PGA Tour, he asked for permission to continue doing so, something that's allowed by the rules of the game of golf, but not by the PGA's special rules governing professional tournaments. The PGA refused, arguing that waiving the so-called walking rule would fundamentally alter the nature of the tournament play and give Martin an unfair advantage, since walking injected the factor of fatigue into PGA competition. And so Martin sued under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the district court ruled in his favor, and the Ninth Circuit agreed. The petition presented fact-bound error, error correction, no circuit split. So the clerks were a little bit caught off guard when, when the Supreme Court granted cert. When my co-clerks, Joe Tai and Andy Siegel, asked Justice Stevens about it, he explained that sometimes the court needs to take a case just because it's fun <laughs> to make up for all the ERISA cases. <laughs> Ultimately, seven justices sided with Martin with only Justices Scalia and Thomas dissenting. And when the Chief Justice assigned the majority opinion to Justice Stevens, he was positively giddy. Fairness, golf, and Scalia in dissent, the trifecta. <laughs> I can imagine no, more, no case more perfectly designed to bring out the essential elements of Justice Stevens' approach to fairness and to judicial decision making. Justice Stevens' opinion for the court was trademark JPS. He began with a careful textual analysis of the ADA, including a reference to Congress's broad intent in enacting the statute and the legislative history. <laughs> One purpose of the ADA, he observed, was to force the reevaluation of long-standing practices that have the effect of excluding disabled people when reasonable accommodations would prevent that. Fairness requires just these sorts of individualized determinations, not reflexive references to the way things have always been done. And as usual, Justice Stevens took extremely seriously the trial court's factual findings, particularly its finding that the fatigue Martin endures from playing with his disability, even while riding in a golf cart, was undeniably greater than the fatigue that other competitors experience from walking the course. And this meant that Martin derived no competitive advantage from the requested accommodation, even on the PGA's account of the reasons behind the walking rule. But to my mind, the persuasive heart of Justice Stevens' opinion was his takedown of the notion that walking, or for that matter, physical exertion, is in any sense essential to the game of golf, even at the professional level. Golf, he explained, is a low-intensity activity. <laughs> but, but not content with simply stating what for many of us is the obvious, he observed that the average golfer expends fewer than 500 calories walking an 18-hole course, 18 course, puckishly pointing out that even that minimal exertion is spread over a five-hour period that includes many opportunities for rest and refreshment. <laughs> Finally, Justice Stevens took note of the many exceptions the PGA already makes to the walking rule in qualifying play, but also in professional play when necessary for logistical reasons. And given this overall context, Refusing to allow Casey Martin to ride in the golf cart was the antithesis of fairness. It represented the kind of rigid and exclusionary insistence on formal equal treatment for no good reason that the ADA was designed to prevent. Now, for Justice Scalia in dissent, the case was an easy one. The very nature of competitive sport, he said, is the measurement by uniform rules of unevenly distributed excellence. This unequal distribution is precisely what determines winners and losers. And artificially to even out that distribution is to destroy the game. Of course, we know from countless other cases and from their extramural writings that this conflict between Justice Stevens' contextual approach to fairness and Justice Scalia's rigid insistence on, on equal treatment was not merely disagreement about fairness in the game of golf. It reflected a far more fundamental disagreement about what constitutes fairness 
in the game of life. PGA versus Martin exemplify Justice Stevens' passion for fairness, as well as his appreciation of context, his comfort with complexity, and his respect for the virtue of judgment. It was also a fun case about golf. It was Justice Stevens at his very finest. and We miss him. Thank you, Eduardo. Our next speaker is the Honorable Corrine Beckwith, who is a judge on the District of Columbia Court of Appeals and who clerked for Justice Stevens in the 1993 term. Hi everyone, this is weird. I feel like I should unmute myself or something, <laughs> unmute myself. Um, it is hard uh, to even begin to capture Justice Stevens in a few words. My co-clerk and lifelong friend, Sean Donahue, during an interview on C-SPAN, once tried. He called him a, quote, deeply curious person, a phrase that perhaps raises more questions than answers. Um, <laughs> What I'd like to focus on is something of keen interest to me as I strive and every day fail to come close to the example Justice Stevens set. And that is Justice Stevens' take on what it means to be a judge. He had strong feelings on the subject and a deep respect for the role of judges. Justice Stevens wanted the public to have confidence in the even-handedness of the courts. He cared about transparency. He cared, and he made sure we cared, about process. And beyond perception, he cared about getting it right. To that end, he was unwaveringly open-minded. He wanted to consider a range of views, including, for some reason, ours. In soliciting those views, Justice Stevens put people at ease, which was great if you happen to be completely in awe of the large marble building you worked in and intimidated by most of the people in it. When Justice Stevens asked us questions about the cases we were preparing, he would often preface it by saying, if you know, uh, it was fine if we didn't, though of course we would quickly figure it out. For someone who cracked enemy military codes and won bronze stars and sat on the Supreme Court of the United States, he was a remarkably down-to-earth, easy to talk to, straightforward. When I interviewed with him for the clerkship, he confused me greatly by informing me near the end of the interview that however things turned out, I like you. Uh, <laughs> unfamiliar with his forthrightness, I was absolutely certain that meant I wasn't getting the job. So, I remember Justice Stevens going to amazing lengths to reserve judgment on the issues in a case until he had read everything and heard oral argument. On one occasion, he reprimanded one of us, okay, it was me, uh, when we mentioned that of the group of law clerks who got together to discuss a case that was coming up for argument, all of them had the same view of the threshold issue in the case. It turns out Justice Stevens definitely did not want to know that. Uh, he didn't want to be swayed. Writing his own first drafts and staying out of the cert pool were also ways of preserving the independence that he viewed as so imperative. Perhaps the clearest manifestation of his independence was his penchant for writing separately. And we all have our favorite Stevens concurrences and dissents, but one of mine, perhaps in part because of my prior life as a public defender before I became a judge, is his concurrence in Kyles versus Whitley. There, the court held five to four that a man's conviction and death sentence should be vacated where the cumulative effect of the government's violations of Brady versus Maryland might well have been outcome determinative. Justice Scalia wrote a searing dissent arguing that the case was too fact-bound 
to have even warranted the court's review in the first place. Justice Stevens joined the majority, but he wrote separately to respond to Justice Scalia, as he loves to do. What stands out about his concurrence to me was his insistence that there are times when even Supreme Court justices have to delve into those dusty record boxes and decide something inherently factual, like whether the suppression of evidence made a difference at a trial. Justice Stevens took that deep dive in Kyle and based on his, quote, independent review of the case, a case where Brady violations were repre repeated and flagrant, where the jury in the first trial had deadlocked, he had significant doubts about Curtis Lee Kyle's guilt. He didn't think he was doing anything extraordinary. He simply thought it was his job. He wrote that our duty to administer justice occasionally requires busy judges to engage in a detailed review of the particular facts of a case, even though our labors may not provide posterity with a newly minted rule of law. Particularly given the popularity of capital punishment, he concluded, I cannot agree that our position in the judicial hierarchy makes such review inappropriate. Sometimes the performance of an unpleasant duty conveys a message more significant than even the most penetrating legal analysis. The flip side of Justice Stevens' broad view of the Supreme Court's own role in correcting errors that are within the court's purview is his insistence that the court not overextend its reach to issues not within its purview. For example, and I didn't get the memo that we weren't supposed to mention this case, but in his dissent in Bush versus Gore, uh, in defending the Florida Supreme Court's own interpretation of the state legislature's intent in its election laws, Justice Stevens rejected what he saw as the petitioner's, quote, unstated lack of confidence in the impartiality and capacity of the state judges who would make the critical decisions if the vote count were to proceed. Such confidence in those courts and the people who ran them was, he wrote, the true backbone of the rule of law. And he, of course, ended on a weighty note. He said, although we may never know with complete certainty the identity of the winner of this year's presidential election, the identity of the loser is perfectly clear. It is the nation's confidence in the judge as an impartial guardian in, of the rule of law. And again, what was also perfectly clear to Justice Stevens was that in that case, the Florida Supreme Court simply did what courts do. I'd like to end with a quote from another native son of Illinois, the poet Carl Sandburg. Exactly 100 years ago this month, in his poem, Washington Monument at Night, Sandburg wrote this line, the Republic is a dream. Nothing happens unless first a dream. The reason Justice Stevens had respect for the rule of law and for the role of the judge is not that he believed our legal institutions were perfect or even highly functional. It's that he knew that these institutions, like the Republic itself, were capable of being great and were worth fighting for to make them great. And I couldn't agree more with Damien. If we want to honor Justice Stevens' legacy, we will continue that work ourselves. Thank you, Corey. Our next speaker is Skip Paul, who is senior advisor at Centerview Partners and who clerked for Justice Stevens in the 1975 term, the Justice's First. Good afternoon. I feel it's important to correct the record um, Chief Judge Barron mentioned something about Justice Stevens' golf abilities. Um, I've played a lot of golf in my life, but the last game I played with Justice Stevens, in fact, the last year of his life, was by far the best game, the best performance by a golfer at the age of 99 I've ever seen. <laughs> Now, to turn the clock back a bit, 
Um, late morning on the Friday after Thanksgiving in 1975, the Chicago Federal Courthouse was closed. Judge Stevens, my co-clerk, and I were catching up on some backlog when the phone rang, interrupting our work. It was President Ford calling to inform Judge Stevens that he was announcing the nomination to the Supreme Court later that afternoon. The judge stepped into our, our office, the clerk's office, told us the exciting news, and said it was to be strictly confidential until late that afternoon. However, he was gonna spend some time taking a walk around Chicago, starting down by the Art Institute. Judge Stevens' mind must have been full of Chicago memories as he headed out of the federal building, walking down to the lakefront. In reflection, back on the, the Chicago skyline, he'd remember his years of Chicago education from his grade school and undergraduate home at the University of Chicago through Northwestern Law School. Also in that downtown skyline, he would see the location of the investigation of the Illinois Supreme Court led by him as a private citizen. This investigation resulted in the removal of two justices from that court. It's a bold result that revealed Stevens' deep belief that the justice system depends on lawyers serving the public interest in an independent and nonpartisan way. The investigation in public service propelled the lawyer, John Paul Stevens, to an appointment on the Seventh Circuit. Hopefully, on that walk, his joy was not broken and his memories were not turned sour by his eyes looking to the western horizon and the skies above Wrigley Field, the home of his beloved Cubs, with the realization that he'd be leaving them. Just three weeks after that walk, he would be confirmed unanimously by the Senate. Six weeks after that call from President Ford, Nellie Pitts and I were here in Washington moving into the new chambers with a stack of work to do aided by the addition of a new co-clerk, George Rutherglen, who joined us from Justice Douglas Chambers. The warm welcome for Judge Steve, Justice Stevens was actually a welcome back. It was a welcome back to the Rutledge clerk returning from the 1947 term. His clerkship and close relationship with Justice Rutledge, a former law school dean, formed the foundation and the fabric of Stevens' priority on his own men men mentorship of his clerks. After my clerkship, um, I practiced law for a short time, but then as Justice Stevens repeatedly told me, I strayed from the law and went into a career in the entertainment business, something, a risk he sh clearly sh should have known in hiring a law clerk from Los Angeles. <laughs> but all through the 40 years after my clerkship, I never made an important life decision, an important business decision without his thoughtful and caring advice. But one funny thing always happened when I came here for that advice. Regardless of my age, when I was in my 40s, 50s, or 60s, a little older than that now, once sitting in his chambers asking for the advice and the conversation started, I became a 25-year-old law clerk. <laughs> and Stevens became the boss. Time stood still in this mentorship. After 20 years on the court, Justice Stevens began a discussion with some of his former clerks about his own legacy. His thinking and direction were classic Stevens, guided by humility, a dedication of public interest, and a belief in mentorship. The Stevens Public Interest Fellowships were launched at Northwestern in 1996, initially funded by clerks and first expanded into law, law schools where clerks were on faculty so we could guide the evolution of the model. When Justice Stevens retired in, in 2010, the Stevens Foundation was formed to expand the existing public interest program. To date, 788 fellowships have been granted and the foundation is operating in 40 law schools. The fellowships encourage and support the law students to pursue work in public interest. This summer, there will be 150 Stevens Public Interest Fellows in law schools. After graduation, the track record of the Stevens Fellows going into and pursuing careers in public interest is 74%. And the Stevens Fellowships presently are the second largest summer public interest fellowship program in the country. The Stevens Fellows have become the next generation and extension 
of the Stevens Clerk family. His gift to us of mentorship has produced a legacy of mentorship and a shared dedication to the importance of supporting young lawyers in pursuing careers in public interest. One thing has become clear. As with Justice Stevens' own appointment, a Stevens clerkship is for a lifetime. Thank you. Skip just reminded me that I was wrong as I was coming up here, so let the record reflect that he was the better than average golfer. <laughs> Thank you, Skip. Our next speaker is Hannah Mullen, who is a clinical fellow at Georgetown University Law Center and Justice Stevens' granddaughter. Good afternoon. As has been mentioned, I'm the sixth of Justice Stevens' nine grandchildren and, perhaps improbably, the only one foolish enough or lucky enough to follow him into the law. My grandfather was a great justice and a great person, and he was also the greatest grandpa in the world. He was fun. In Florida, he swam in the ocean and built sandcastles with us. We faced off for hours playing board games, trading victories in Scrabble and backgammon until my mother begged us to come to dinner. The food was getting cold. Grandpa loved us and he showed it. He brought my sister and me sugar cookies from our favorite bakery. He was a patron of our elementary school chorus concerts. We would beam at his old timey grandpa-isms like, well, isn't that something? when one of us brought home a good report card or won a lacrosse championship. Grandpa treated his grandchildren as his intellectual and athletic equals. It sounds ridiculous, but it's true. He would gloat after hitting cross-table forehands in ping pong. Before a backpacking trip I took as a teenager, he gave me a copy of Sense and Sensibility so we could discuss it when I returned from the woods. <laughs> I think he was disappointed Jane Austen wasn't for me. When I enrolled in law school, Grandpa began giving me law review articles to read so we could talk about them over his morning cup of coffee. And those articles were often written by his former clerks. He was so proud of all of you. He liked reading Jane Austen, but not nearly as much as he liked reading you all. And Grandpa didn't hold forth during our intergenerational book clubs. He asked what I thought and listened, even though I knew so little. He was the most brilliant person I ever met and yet he could make the people around him feel brighter rather than dimmer in his presence. I miss grandpa every day, but since graduating from law school and becoming a civil rights lawyer, I've had the strange privilege of becoming more familiar with a different side of the man I knew and loved, the jurist Justice Stevens. Every time I read one of Justice Stevens' opinions, I see another thing that I loved about my grandpa. For example, as has already been discussed, my grandfather is well known for his attention to the record in each individual case. He's described as a judge's judge who looks at each case on its merits. And grandpa sweated the small stuff off the bench too. He remembered the names of my elementary school classmates. He kept strawberry ice cream in his freezer so that my sister, who didn't share his love of chocolate, would always have a dessert she enjoyed. It's easy to knock neurosis, but for grandpa, attention to detail was a form of love, of seeing what was distinct about a person and their circumstances. It made him friends everywhere he went, even among people who disagreed with him. So I smile knowingly when I read an opinion like grandpa's partial concurrence in Illinois v. Wardlow, a Fourth Amendment case that asked whether someone's unprovoked flight from police was sufficiently suspicious to justify a Terry stop. In his separate opinion, Grandpa praised the majority for, rejected a per se, for rejecting a per se rule and then explained why he believed the facts in that case did not support a finding of reasonable suspicion. I admire Grandpa's opinion in Wardlow because he took special care to explain that different people may react to police differently, even when they're not doing anything wrong. 
He pointed out that innocent people, depending on their circumstances, could reasonably view police as a sign that danger is near, or perhaps even fear the police themselves. The facts of each individual case, he urged, should determine whether reasonable suspicion existed. I'm similarly filled with nostalgia when I read one of Grandpa's many separate solo opinions. A personal favorite is his dissent in Scott v. Harris, if you're looking for some light reading later. Grandpa did what he thought was right even when most other people thought he was wrong. I mean, the guy ate apple pie for breakfast and he wore bow ties to work. He wasn't afraid of standing out in a crowd. And he wasn't afraid of speaking his mind either. Anyone who's written a college thesis knows how it feels to have your whole family praise you for something they're probably not going to read. <laughs> Grandpa, on the other hand, read all 30,000 words of my senior thesis and then told me why he thought I was wrong. <laughs> I've never felt more kinship with Justice Scalia than in that moment. <laughs> in being fully himself, he showed us that we could be ourselves too. The reason I love Grandpa's opinions is because they show that he was the same man on the bench and at the coffee table, tenacious and empathetic and observant and funny. His belief in spirited competition between equals was what made him hate bullies. He strove to see each person and their circumstances as unique, imbuing him with instinctive sympathy for the underdog. When I advocate for my clients, I often find myself citing my grandfather's opinions. I think that's the best way we can honor him, by using his words to try to do good. And I'm moved to know that generations of lawyers will continue to get to know him and inevitably come to love him through the words he left behind. I hope we make him proud. Thank you, Hannah. I'd like to invite Teresa Wynn Roseborough, who is general counsel for the Home Depot, who clerked for Justice Stevens in the 1987 term, to join me to move the adoption of the resolutions to be presented to the court. Thank you, David. Thank you to all the eulogists who've spoken today. As you have gleaned from their remarks, Justice Stevens was a remarkable man and a remarkable jurist. All of us, even if he had not been a justice of the United States Supreme Court, would have been just as proud to work for him and would have been just as enriched by his intellect, his professionalism, his love for his country and its constitution, his sense of fairness, his devotion to the protection of liberty, his gentle good humor, and his humility. Justice Stevens was a patriot and a guardian. Having meritoriously served this country in war, he possessed a special regard for what this nation stands for. As Navy Chaplain Captain Judy Milana, who is with us here today, said in honoring the justice as he lay in repose in this hall, he was indeed a great man from our greatest generation who faithfully answered the call to serve our country when we, the people, needed him most. In Texas v. Johnson, Justice Stevens famously dissented from the court striking down of a Texas statute barring desecration of the flag. He said, the American flag is more than a proud symbol of the courage, the determination, and the gifts of nature that transformed 13 fledgling colonies into a world power. It is a symbol of freedom, of equal opportunity, of religious tolerance, and goodwill. This statement reflects Justice Stevens' deep devotion to this country as itself a beacon of freedom, equal opportunity, religious tolerance, and goodwill. It was not the flag alone but this country he could not bear to see desecrated. Justice Stevens was resolute and brave, going without fear or restraint where facts and law led him, with no ambition to, still, to tilt the scales to suit his ends or to incline future 
decisions to his pleasure or preferences. For this reason, he's proved a conundrum for constitutional scholars who have sought, unsuccessfully, to identify lines of ideology that would have allowed the successful prediction of how he might decide a particular case or type of case. It may be that Justice Stevens will face history as an enigma and defy any characterization. I believe, though, that his record of dedicated and faithful service to this nation and its rule of law will force us to create a new category, category not liberal, not conservative, but simply impartial. The Committee on Resolutions has prepared resolutions summarizing Justice Stevens' many contribution to this nation and its laws, and you have its work before you. Together with the committee's co-chairs, Jamal Green and Carol Lee, I have the honor to move their adoption. Thank you, Teresa. The resolutions are now before us for adoption. If adopted, they will be presented to the court by the Solicitor General. I now put the resolutions to a vote. All in favor of adopting the resolutions, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? No one is opposed. Hearing no opposition, I declare the resolutions adopted, and this completes our work here. I want to say in closing that Justice Stevens' association with this court just barely postdates World War II, when first he served here as a law clerk to Justice Rutledge. It spans the time that he argued here as a leading lawyer in Chicago, and it includes, of course, the time he first took the bench here as a justice in 1975 and all the ensuing three plus decades that followed. It was always an institution that he admired and cherished, and we in turn admired and cherished him. Before we proceed to the court session, I would like to thank counsel to the Chief Justice Jeffrey Manier, Marshal Gail Curley, Clerk Scott Harris, their court officer colleagues, and their staffs for helping us with this very meaningful proceeding. Thank you. Uh, guests and members of the Supreme Court Bar, you may proceed into the courtroom.